Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in his noble book known as Al-Qur'an Shahid Allah annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu wa ulu al-ilm qa'imun bil qist la ilaha illahu wal aziz al-hakim Allah bears witness that there is no doubt worthy of worship in truth except He and the angels bear witness and the people of knowledge bear witness the people of knowledge are in agreement that seeking Islamic knowledge is an obligation upon every single Muslim. And the people of knowledge are in agreement that the first type of knowledge or the first path a student pursues to seek knowledge should be the path of seeking knowledge of the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ilm al-Tawheed, the knowledge with regards to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the first obligation upon every single human being. And there is no disagreement with regards to this. Because the ayah which I quoted clearly shows the significance and the merit and the virtue that Allah Himself testifies to His oneness and His love. And then the angels. And then the people of knowledge. The people of knowledge includes the ulama and those who have knowledge of the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who may not be smart. So this is with regards to the first issue. The second issue is the purpose of why we seek knowledge. First of all, we should seek knowledge sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should be mukhlis when we seek knowledge. This knowledge which we are going to learn, the purpose and the objective of learning this knowledge is to remove the ignorance within ourselves and to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are seeking knowledge here only for one purpose. We are seeking knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the ignorance within us and after we have sought this knowledge, then the objective of seeking this knowledge is to act upon this knowledge. And after acting upon this knowledge, to call to this knowledge. So this is what the objective of a Muslim should be. To seek knowledge, to act upon this knowledge, to call for this knowledge, and to defend this knowledge against any batil that may come in front of it. The book which we are going to study, the title of the <coughs> seminar or the next few weeks, the, uh, the course that which we are going to study, then we decided to call this the, the subject of, or the title of the poster was Ta'leem al-Shababi al-Tawheed Teaching the youth al-Tawheed I believe that was the title <coughs> The real name of this book was Ta'leem al-Sibiyani al-Tawheed Teaching children at Tawheed. Because we did not want the Shabab to become sentimental or to think that we are 
uh, degrading them in any way, so we decided to change the title. But in reality, every single student of knowledge who starts to seek knowledge is like a small child. Everybody who starts to seek knowledge, regardless of how old he is, when he starts to seek knowledge, he is like a child. So we are all like children when it comes to seeking knowledge. That's why you find many amongst the elderly who are at the age of 60 and 70 and 80, they start to learn how to read the Quran. They are studying the same which the children in the madrasa in the evening are studying. So they, in, in, in other words, there is no age restriction when it comes to seeking knowledge. And every single person when he starts to seek knowledge is like a child. But we decided to change the title to keep the peace with everybody by calling this Ta'aleem al-Shabaab al-Tawheed. Teaching the Shabaab al-Tawheed. The Shabaab are Shabaab by age and children by seeking knowledge. All of us. So with regards to this book, we're going to have a tamhi, which is known as an introduction. We're going to start this book with an introduction. An introduction which is known as a tamhi. This introduction is going to have two maqsads. and maqsada. I mean two objectives or two important issues to discuss. So, with the aid and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nashra'a fil maqsad al awwal We begin with the first maqsad. Maqsad meaning an important issue. I mentioned to you that the name of this book is Ta'aleem al-Sibiyani al-Tawheed. Ta'aleem al-Sibiyani al-Tawheed. Teaching children al-Tawheed. Another name for this book is Al Usul al Thalatha. Al Usul al Thalatha. And pay attention very carefully because a lot of brothers and sisters they get this mixed up. So this Risala or this treatise has two names Al Usul al Thalatha O Ta'aleem al Sibiyani al Tawheed. The three fundamental principles for teaching children at Tawheed. There is another book which is known as Thalafatul Usuli wa Adillatuma. There is another book which is known as Thalafatul Usuli wa Adillatuma. This book is different from Al Usul al Thalaf, written by the same author. Written by the same author. So we have Al Usul al Thalafatu, which is a small treatise, a small risal. And we have Thalafatu al Usuli wa Adillatu, which is a bigger risal. Both are written by the same author, but two different books. Al Usul al Thalafatu was written for the children. And Thalatha al Usul wa Adillatuha was written for advanced students. Al Usul al Thalatha was written for the children and for the normal people. Thalatha al Usul wa Adillatuha was written for somebody who already had knowledge of Tawheed, for that person to, to progress with regards to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we know this difference? Some people think that Al Usul al Thalatatu and Thalatatu al Usul wa Adilatuha are exactly the same. That's why they get mixed up when they mention the names. That's not the case. Thalatatu al Usul is what you find in the English language. You, know, you find this in the English language that it's the three fundamental principles which have been published with the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salah al Taymi and other scholars. So the famous one is. It's been published and it's been translated into the English language with the explanation of who? Sheikh Mahmoud ibn Saad al -Batin. The Risala which we are going to study is different. It's al usul al -Tala. It's for the children, it's small. How do we know this? 
ثلاثه الاصول ستارت ويد اعلم ارشدك الله لطاعته ان الحنفيه ملت ابراهيم هي ان تعبد الله وحده مخلصا له الدين. This is how ثلاثة الأصول starts. الأصول الثلاثة هذه رسالة starts different. Another second point is that الأصول الثلاثة which is our رسالة is smaller in size and concise and does not have a lot of evidence. Whereas ثلاثة الأصول which was which is for the advancements has more evidence and more deduction of proofs and points. We also find that the students of the author, they authored two other books also on the same topic. So, on the same topic of the three principles. For example, in one of the Risalas we find that Shaykh al-Islam says, اعلم رحمك الله أنه يجب علينا تعلم أربع مسائل الأولى then he goes. In another risala we find that he says, اعلم رحمك الله أنه يجب على كل مسلم ومسلمة تعلم هذه المسائل الثلاثة. So in total how many مسائل do we have for? First one is الأصول الثلاثة which is our book also known as تعليم السبيان التوحيد Second one is ثلاثة الأصول وأدلتها. Third is another risala starts differently, and a fourth is another risala which starts differently. And all of these rasail can be found in a book called Al Durr al Sanniya. Al Durr al Sanniya, which is a compilation of the fatwa of ulama al Jadi. So this was the first point which. Uh, I wanted to make which was the first maqsad. The, the manhaj or the methodology of this book, which is our book, Al-Usul Al-Thalathatu, is that the Shaykh, he asks a question and then he gives an answer. So the whole book, from the beginning to the end, is in the form of asking questions and answers. And you usually find that when you want to teach the kids, if you, te if you tell the kids a question and then give them the answer, they tend to remember that more frequently than just explaining something to them. And this is a very good way or manner of learning knowledge of questions and answers. So this is with regards to the first maqsad. So has it become clear to us? That Al-Usul Al-Thalathatu is our book, which is also known as Ta'aleem Al-Sibyan Al-Tawheed, teaching children Tawheed. Salatatul Usul wa Adillatuha is a different book. And then we have two more risalas which have been written or compiled by the students of Shaykh al-Islam, the author of this book. So in total we have four risalas. This was with regards to the first issue. Now with regards to the um, title of the book, many brothers who know the Arabic language you know, they said to me when I got the post that I designed, I said that the title of the book is Ta'aleem Al-Sibiyani Al-Tawheed. They said this is a mistake, it should be Ta'aleem Al-Sibiyani Al-Tawheed. No matter. Somebody sent me a message, he said maybe the designer has made a mistake. In the, the critical marks, you know, the Arab that you have in the end, the Fatha, the Dhamma, the Kasra, or like in the Urdu language we say Zabar Zer Pesh. So I said there's no mistake. It is exactly as I said. The title of the book is Ta'aleem Sibiyani at Tawheed. It's not at Tawheed. Grammatically it should be at Tawheed. That is Mafur will be here for Ta'aleem. But we found the title of the book written like this in the manuscript. And when he will be referred back to the manuscript of Shaykh al-Islam's book, and he wrote this risala, we found it that it was written, Ta'aleem al-Sibiyani al-Tawheed. And when you find an author who writes something, you do not have the right to change it. So it is better to say, Ta'aleem al-Sibiyani al-Tawheed, 
But because Shaykh al-Islam, he himself wrote this, and when he wrote this, maybe he wrote it as Ta'alim al-Sibyali al So I gave an answer and I said, to those who understand the Arabic language, and this is just something, additional benefit. We haven't started the book. This is only for those who know the Arabic language. That I said that uh, this is not as Badul Ghalat. Badul Ghalat, I said, Arad al Mu'allif ayya kula tawheed fa ghalata fa qala sibiyat fa abdalahu wa aidahu sawwara. When the Shaykh was writing Ta'alim al Sibiyat, he was supposed to write something else and then he wrote a tawheed with a kasr. Maybe he was intending to write something else, and this is known as something which is not in the Arabic language as Badr Ghalat. And this happens a lot by a lot of the scholars. So this could be one of the reasons, or it was another reason. But for us, we cannot change it, the title, and we leave it as it is. But we can say that it is better to say Ta'aleem Musibiyani at Tawheed. But we can't change it. Because this is how we find it. Maybe he knows the reason. Tayyip, is that clear? With regards to this, with regards to the Arab of the book, then we will leave the Arab of the title of the Surah Falata to the Wahali of the Surah Falata, etc. We'll move on to the second box. The second box of this book is the first question Who is the author of this book? Who is the author of this book? This is the first. We haven't started the book, this is still the introduction. This is now the second part of the introduction. Who is the author, the Mu'allif, the Had al Kitab? He is Al Imam Al Alim Al Amil, Mujaddid Al Da'wat Al Islamiyya, Al Millat Al Hanafiyya, Al Alim Al Rabbani, Al Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, Ibn Suleyman, Ibn Ali, Ibn Muhammad, Ibn Ahmad. Ibn Rashid, Al-Tamimi, Al-Najdi, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab bin Sulaiman bin Ali bin Muhammad bin Ahmad bin Rashid, Al-Tamimi, Al-Najdi, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. Bin Sulaiman, Bin Ali, Bin Muhammad, Bin Ahmad, Bin Rashid, Al Tamimi, Al Najdi. Anybody who memorizes this, next week we bring sweets. So if you're a young boy, we'll give you a sweet. And if you're a old, if you're an old man, we'll still give you sweets because you're technically still a young boy. So if anybody who memorizes this, inshallah, will be given a prize. You know, we have some other books as well. With Allah khair, the Shaykh uh, Nasir, he always brings prizes. We have a box of sweets to all at the whole course. That's what I do when I teach this. Small lollipop, so if you get the question right, and if you're an adult with a beard, we'll give you a lollipop. So that, that is the name of the Shaykh. The Shaykh's name is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, ibn Sulaiman, ibn Ali. Ibn Muhammad, Ibn Ahmad, Ibn Rashid, Al Tamimi, Al Najdi. We all know the word Wahhabiya, yes? Wahhabis. No, we all know the name. The title Wahhabiya, that this person is a Wahhabi. So that was the first question. Who is the author of this book? Question number two Where was he born? Where was the Sheikh born? The Sheikh was born in a place called Al Uyayna. Al Uyayna. Al Uyayna. Where is this place? Al Uyayna. Next to Coventry. Next to Leicester. Where is this place? Al Uyayna is located in the northwest of Al Riyadh. Shimal Ghar, Madinat al Riyadh. So, where Riyadh is? Riyadh is the capital city of which country? Yeah? Saudi Arabia. So, Riyadh is the capital city. 
northwest of Riyadh is a small town called Al Uyayn. That is where Sheikh Al Islam Muhammad ibn Abdullah Wahab was born. Al Uyayn. With Ayn. Al Uyayn. The place still exists. So are we clear where this place is? Northwest of Medina. Of northwest of Medina to Riyadh. Not Medina. Northwest of Medina to Riyadh. The city of Riyadh. Uh, where was he born? Northwest of Riyadh. Where was he born? Riyadh. And what is the place called? Al Uyayna. Ayn. Uyayna. The next question, the third question. Where was he born? Third question is. When was he born? What are will it? He was born 1115 years after Hijrah. 1115. Triple 15. Very easy to remember. When was he born? Huh? Not where, when? 1115. 1115 years after Hijrah. After? Hijrah, Tayyip, Gregorian, where were we? With the which year? 700, 1703. The English date would be 1703. The Islamic date would be 100, 1115 after Hijrah. Unfortunately, the Muslims today. They have become lazy in using the Islamic calendar. Alhamdulillah, if you see that the poster we designed for this talk, we always put the Islamic date first and then the Gregorian date. I always make sure that all my students use the Islamic dates. We must start to use the Hijri calendar. So Shaykh al-Islam was born in which year? 1115 after Hijrah, corresponding to 1703. Huh? 1703. Oh, the next question is how was Sheikh al Islam Muhammad al Wahhab raised? How was he raised? How was the Sheikh raised? Today, children are raised. How are they raised? Playing PlayStation. Huh? Today, they are raised playing PlayStation. PlayStation. This new game that has come out, Fortnite. I'm reading some reviews of this. A balawa and a musiba for the Muslims. Make sure you keep your children away from this nonsense. So today you find that the children, they are, they are brought up playing Nintendo Switch and PlayStation and mobiles and games and this and that. In the about 200 years ago, 300 years, 200 years ago, what year we have? 2018. About 300 years ago, the world was in a different planet. It was like the world, uh, planet Earth was in a different universe. So, Sheikh al Islam, how was he brought up? Sheikh al Islam was brought up in the custody of his parents, his father. And at a young age, he started to seek knowledge. His intelligence and his excellence of seeking knowledge became popular whilst he was small. So his father was a scholar. What was the name of his father? What, is the what was the name of Sheikh Islam's father? Who knows? Huh? What was the name of his father? Huh? Abdul Wahab, Abdul Wahab, a Sheikh Abdul Wahab. His grandfather's name was a Sheikh Suleiman. Sheikh Abdul Wahab was a scholar. His father was a scholar. His grandfather was also a scholar, a Sheikh Suleiman. So Sheikh Al Islam, at an early age, when he opened his eyes, he opened his eyes in a house where, where there was only knowledge, Islamic knowledge. Everybody was. So at an early young age, he started to learn about Islam. 
And today we find that when the child opens his eyes, what does he see? PlayStation and Nintendo Switch. So that's what he is indulged in and engrossed in. Sheikh al-Islam, at an early age, he started to seek knowledge. And when he was seeking knowledge, his father saw signs. You know, his intelligence, his excellence, his, his, his power of grasping difficult issues became apparent. He memorized the Quran completely before he was 10 years old. How old was he when he memorized the Quran? 10 years old. <coughs> and then Shaykh al Islam ibn Muhammad al Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, after that, he got married. Now, how old was he when Shaykh al Islam got married? And who knows? What do you think? How old was he? Hi, Shaykh. How old was he when he got married? 20. Ah, 17. Huh? 17. 17. And how old are you? And are you married? Yeah. Huh? How old? How old? How old? Uh, when he got married? Definitely after 10. You're definitely after 10. <laughs> <laughs> definitely after 10 and before. Uh, how is it? How, how, old, how old would you get your son married? You are 25? Uh, anybody else? Uh, uh, how old do you think Shaykh al-Islam was when he got married? 15. Huh? 15. 15. Shaykh al-Islam, how old Wahab got married when he was 12 years old? How old is it? 12 years old and he got his son married. His father says, رَأَيْتُهُ أَهْلًا بِالسَّلَاةِ بِالْجَمَاعَةِ he was already a man at the age of 12. At the age of 12, he was a grown man. And today, you have kids at the age of 12, they don't know how to tie the shoelaces. Ba 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 ba, shoelaces. So he reached the age of puberty before he was 12. And as soon as, and look at him, he reached the age of puberty before he was 12. And when he, ate, when he reached the age of puberty, he himself knew that he had to pray salah in jama'ah. When his father saw that he is praying all his salawat in jama'ah, his father realized that my son has reached the age of puberty. And because he has reached the age of puberty, the sheikh's father said, now let me get him out. Huh? See the intelligence of this boy? So what, what year was he when he got married? Twelve. And how old are you? Twelve. Tell us, we're going to get you married. <laughs> you ready? You want a man? Where is your dad? Huh? So at the age of four. So this shows to that getting married at an earlier age amongst the men as, as well as amongst the women you know that the Prophet said the Prophet was making his marriage with Aisha when she was nine. She was a full grown woman. Yeah, don't think that she was a nine year old girl like today. So this practice still continues where? In which country? Who knows? People get married at 10, 11, 12. Yemen. In Yemen. In Yemen they get married. 11, 12, 13, they get married. So the next question is, so we all know how old was Muhammad Sheikh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab when he got married. Now how old was he? No, oh, nobody can forget this, inshallah. Huh? How old was he? Oh, how old are you? Twelve. How old are you? And how old are you? Yes, you're twelve. Time to get married. <laughs> So the next question is, where did the sheikh seek knowledge? Where did he seek knowledge? The next question is, where did the sheikh go to learn knowledge? 
We must understand fundamentally. Fundamentally, this is a very important point. That if you do not travel to seek knowledge, people should not come to ask you about knowledge. Man la illa That the sunnah, the way, when I mean sunnah, what I mean by sunnah, the way. I don't mean sunnah Muhammad Rasulullah The sunnah of the ulama is to leave your home, to leave your parents, to leave your comfort zone, and go and seek knowledge. The trouble. Rahla. Rahla to talab al ilm. Rahla to talab al ilm. And if you don't have a rahla, a journey, or you leave everybody, you leave your family, you leave your friends, you leave your comfort zone, and you go to seek knowledge. And then when you go to seek knowledge, you go to seek knowledge with the ulama, the inheritors. The warata of the prophets and the messengers. So two things. Number one, you have to leave your house, your family, your district, your city, and go and seek knowledge. And who do you seek knowledge with? The ulama. How we can post? What do we have today? The problem that we have today. What's the problem that we have today? What's the problem that we have on YouTube and on social media? All these people who are giving da'wah, none of them have traveled to seek knowledge. So you read one or two books in your house, in front of your big box, your, what is it, your monitor, your screen, having a nice coffee. You read the book by yourself, you don't study with anybody, and then tell us, you're qualified to give talks. Then. So you're on YouTube, becoming a YouTuber, and giving people for da'wah, and teaching the people the need. Is this not the reality? Is this not what's happening today? Look at the background of most of the people that people listen to today. How many of them have left their homes and made this rihla like Shaykh al-Islam? And when they did leave their houses, they went and studied with who? With the scholars. Today they don't go and study with Tom, Dick and Harry. They went and studied with the ulama. The people who have the real knowledge, the knowledge which was passed on from generation to generation from Muhammad Rasulullah to his students, to their students, to their students, to their students, to this day. So before you take the knowledge from anybody and before you decide that you want to listen to this person, do your CRV check. You know they do the CRV check before you want to get a job. So you've got to do the CRV check. CRV check here is first of all you see that if this person travel. And second, if he did travel, who did he go and study? Was it a weekend course? Was it a degree in a university? This is not traveling. You have to travel to the scholars, the ulama, the ulama rabbaniyun, because they have the true knowledge. The knowledge of Islam is not restricted to a degree or a master's or a PhD degree. The knowledge of Muhammad Rasulullah is inheritance and is inherited from generation to generation. Great scholars of Islam have no degrees, like Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh al -Bad. No BA, no Masters, no PhD. But they had L. That's why the world traveled to them. So where is Sheikh al Islam? Right? First of all, the Sheikh, he studied with his father. He studied the Hanbali Fiqh, Tafsir and Hadith with his father. <laughs> And at an early age, he became dedicated to read the books of Tafsir, Hadith, and Aqeel. He studied the general, all the different disciplines that a, a student of knowledge was studying. The Arabic language, Fiqh. But the Sheikh, at an early age, he had a passion. And he was very passionate about studying the books, the subject of Tafsir, Hadith, and Aqeel. And his favorite author, Sheikh, Sheikh al Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahimullah's famous author, was who? Who knows who was his favorite author? 
Anybody? Give it a team. Famous, the famous author of Sheikh al Islam, Muhammad ibn Wahhab, rahimahullah, was Ibn Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn al Qayyim. So he was, he would read their books night and day. So what did he do? What's the first thing he did? He started to seek knowledge locally. Where did he study? Where is far? Ah, where? Let's see if you understood where. Al Uyayn. In Uyayna, he studied locally. So you find that the students of knowledge, when they start to seek knowledge, they start to seek knowledge locally. Like Bukhari, he started to seek knowledge in Bukhari, and then he traveled. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, he started to seek knowledge locally in Al Uyayna, and then he traveled. So first he studied Hanbali fiqh, Tafsir, Hadith, with who? With his father, with the local scholars, rather than his father. Then he traveled to Mecca. At an early age, he traveled to Mecca with the intention of doing Hajj. And then he traveled to Medina. There in Medina, after doing Hajj, he stayed there for a period of two months. And in this time, he started to seek knowledge with the scholars of Medina. Whilst he stayed in Medina, he started to seek and attend the classes of the ulama. And he benefit, benefited from them. Then, after two months and after performing Hajj, after studying with the scholars of Medina, he returned back home. And then he became busy reading the books of the mother of Imam Ahmed. Then, once again, he left home to seek knowledge. <coughs> and then he went and traveled around wherever he heard that there were great scholars. So he went to Basra. You know where Basra is? Basra. Well, what do we call it? Basra, yeah? Basra. Basra, where's Basra? Iraq. And then he went to Hijaz, which is Mecca and Medina, many times. So he would go and he would seek knowledge. And then he would come back. And then he would go and he would seek knowledge. And then he would come back. And then he would go and he would seek knowledge and he would come back. He would hear there's a great scholar there, so he would go to him. And he does this. And then he went in Najd, the province where he was from, other than Uyayn, the scholars there, around there, he also traveled. He went to Ahsa, another place in Saudi Arabia. Ahsa, there were scholars there. He went and he took knowledge from them. So this was with regards to him seeking knowledge. What do we learn from this? What do we learn with regards to his seeking knowledge? We learn, Shaykh al-Islam, Abdul Wahab, Rahimahullah, dedicated his life and his time to seek knowledge. <coughs> Some people, it is difficult for them to leave home for a big period of time. And some people in the past, they couldn't do this, not like today. Student accommodations and loans and everything when people go to study. In the olden days it was hard. So they would get their provisions together, get a little bit of money, and then they will leave. They will seek knowledge, and then they will come back. Then once again, they will do some work, get some money together, get some provisions ready together, and then go. That is even harder. We saw that the devotion and the commitment was such, Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad al-Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he went to study and he came. He went to study and he came. He went to study and he came back. And he traveled everywhere where he heard that there was great scholars, he traveled. And this should be the objective of the student of knowledge today. If he finds that there is a scholar, then he should travel to him. But what happens here in England is the opposite. You find that instead of the people going to the scholars, the scholars come to the people. Huh? Instead of you, instead of the British people traveling, 
the British Muslims traveling to the scholars, the scholars from Saudi Arabia come to teach them. The great scholars, like Sheikh Anwar Basir al Bas and other sheikhs, they come here to teach the people. They say, oh, I have to go to England to teach the people. Where the reality is, it should be the other way around. That the people should be going to the scholars. Because the people are in need of the scholars, the scholars are not in need of the people. But it's the opposite today. The opposite today that the scholars come to teach the people. The next question. What was the mother of the sheikh? What was he? Was he a Wahhabi? 